Greetings and welcome back to some more Final Fantasy 7. This is going to be a slightly different video from usual, it's going to be more of a homekeeping video. We are technically able to go into the Northern Cave at this point and head into the final section of the game, but there's still a few things to be done on the world map. The first thing we need to do is chocobo breeding, and I had actually forgotten what a pain in the arse this is. It's not enough to simply catch a chocobo because a lot of them are in pretty poor condition. We need to catch them in specific areas in order to get the best breeds. Now to the best of my knowledge there is nothing in game that actually tells you where to go or where the best places would be. You'd think that talking to chocobo belly would enlighten you but from what I could see, nothing. So naturally I consulted my good friend Google. I went up by Icicle Inn and after much faffing around fighting monsters and occasionally attacking the chocobo by mistake, I got a few decent ones. And this is where the fun really begins, and by fun I mean tedium. We need to go to the gold saucer and do some chocobo racing. A lot of chocobo racing, like loads of it. So much so that you'd swear you'd become sugar high by the bright colourful graphics. You want to get your chocobo up to at least A class, though preferably S class. The racing isn't bad exactly if you have a decent chocobo, it's just it gets rather repetitive and dull. One thing that happens every now and again is this guy called Joe turns up on a black chocobo and he's a son of a bitch because he will win the race. And because you advance in rank through winning, he is basically slowing your progress down. I guess the idea of all this racing is that your animals will be super fit, so when they bonk they make an even fitter baby. Once you've got the chocobos at the preferred rank and you feed them some nuts, they get down to business and they produce... another yellow chocobo. Yeah, a little bit of luck and a lot of expensive nuts are required, but eventually I got a blue female chocobo. Not long after I managed to get a green one and thankfully it was male. It can be a pain in the arse getting two females or two males. Fortunately this didn't happen as much as it could have. So another round of racing happens with the blue and green chocobos and once again Joe turns up to ruin the fun. Eventually we can get back to breeding and we end up with not one black chocobo but Two black chocobos! Oh, the joys of blasting past Joe and winning a race against him. After all that racing, the black chocobos can finally get down to business and give us a... Oh look, the achievement's given it away. We have a gold chocobo! Final Fantasy VII has been making me think about how the execution of achievement notices in games could be done a bit more subtly, or could be better timed. Oh great, ruin the moment with an achievement notice, thanks game. Now we can reap the real reward of all this chocobo breeding, rare materia. The game has been teasing us with cave entrances that are not possible to access, but with the gold chocobo, nothing is inaccessible. There are four of these caves. One contains mine materia that I'm not particularly interested in. Another contains materia that swaps a character's HP and MP. I really don't see what the point of it is. Yes, you could gain an incredible amount of MP allowing you to go crazy with magic attacks, but if there was an enemy that you needed to do that with, would you want to put yourself in such a vulnerable position as to only have an HP of about 500? The other two are fantastic. Quadra magic allows you to cast a paired spell four times. I like to pair it with Ultima as that spell cast four times in a row can do a decent amount of damage. The other is Knights of the Round, which is the most badass summon in the game. Yes, you could learn a foreign language in the time it takes to play out, but it's incredibly helpful going into the final section of the game. The Gold Chocobo also lets you get access to the Ancient Forest, a curious little section of the game in which we have to platform on plants that are out to get us, using frogs and stones to help us navigate it. This is a bit of a challenge as some of the platforming is timed so you have to be fast on your feet in order to navigate it. There is some nice treasure to be picked up here. My favourite being the slash all materia which allows a physical attack to affect all enemies on screen. This in combination with Cloud's ultimate weapon allows for a lot of damage to be dished out. 
Speaking of the ultimate weapon, we get it by finishing off the ultimate weapon once and for all. The ultimate weapon ended the battle with a shadow flare attack, which killed Cloud, but allowed for it to be learned as an enemy skill. This irritated me because you can level up quite a bit after defeating the weapon, so naturally I didn't want Cloud to die at the end of the fight. So I tried it again, and Cloud died again. This time he cast it on Barret, who has an accessory that reflects back all magic attacks onto the enemies. While it was awesome to see him being hoisted by his own petard, it meant I didn't actually learn the enemy's skill. I was resigned to the fact that Cloud had to die. But when I came back to this for the fourth time, he missed! But I still got the enemy skill, so it worked out okay in the end. After all that hassle, do you know how many times I actually used the Shadow Flare attack on an enemy? Here's a hint. Never. Getting the Ultima weapon means that the battle arena is now significantly easier, especially with Slash All and Counter Materia, which causes massive damage with little effort. It doesn't hurt either to have a ribbon accessory equipped, as it means the plethora of status effects thrown at Cloud won't actually do anything. I did, however, encounter one soul-destroying problem in the battle square. You have to spend 10 GP for every battle. I ran out before I had gained the amount of battle points needed to buy Cloud's level 4 limit break, and of course as soon as you leave the battle square area, you lose all your points. It was bloody annoying to say the least. However, the gold saucer does have this dodgy looking guy hanging out near the save point who will sell you GP in exchange for Gil. So back I went to do the battles all over again. But it was worth it because Cloud's level 4 limit break is pretty awesome, as we will see in a later video. When I visited the waterfall in a previous video and saw the ghost of Lucretia, I neglected to actually go back in a second time. If you do, you get both Vincent's ultimate weapon, the death penalty, and his level 4 limit break, Chaos. We also had to get Tifa's level 4 limit break in her bedroom, or rather a reconstruction of her bedroom, in Nibelheim. You have to play the piano and play the Final Fantasy VII melody. Tifa finds a letter in the sheet music from Zangan, her old teacher. It fills us in on what happened to Tifa directly after the attack from Zephyroth, and we find her level 4 limit break, Final Heaven. We also had to find everyone's ultimate weapons. Now, Barret's I was meant to pick up when we returned to Midgar and fought the Proud Clod. Apparently it's unmissable, and yet somehow I managed to miss it. So too is Cat She's, but God, who gives a shit about him? Red 13s is found by revisiting Cosmo Canyon and having one final heart to heart with Buggenhagen. It's actually a rather moving scene as Buggenhagen is clearly at the end of his life and saying goodbye to Red, though he does tell Red to use his eyes, which is a bit cruel considering he only has one. Before he dies, though, he gives Red the limited moon. What really got me though was when Red comes back out and pretends his grandfather has actually just gone off on another journey. Cloud, who's usually a bit of a dummy about such things, plays along, saying maybe they'll bump into him somewhere. Yuffie's ultimate weapon, the Conformer, is found in the sunken ship. I'd already been in there in a previous video but forgot that there was actually another room. Sometimes these things are a bit difficult to spot in this game, which is probably why you have the option to turn on red and green markers to highlight doors and objects that Cloud can interact with. Sid's is a simple case of returning to Rocket Town and chatting with the old man who used to love staring at the rocket. Yeah, I guess we kind of took his hobby away from him. I guess he's also a bit of a weapons collector. He previously gave us a sword for Cloud, and now he's giving us Sid's ultimate weapon, Venus Gospel. Tifus requires a bit more effort. 
We have to return to Midgar and Wall Market, but in order to do that we have to first go to Bone Village and dig up the key. Because that makes sense. From there we can return to Sector 5. We pass by Aeris' old church and if we go in, just for a second we can see a ghostly image of her, but it disappears before we get too close. I read somewhere that there were some early plans to make it possible to revive her, but they were abandoned and this is all that remains of that. Whether that's actually true or that this is just a wee easter egg, I'm not too sure. In Wall Market we go into the item tent and uh, basically just steal the premium heart. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. I don't remember now what made me go back into the Shinra mansion, but I had forgotten all about the flashback we get showing the aftermath of the Nibelheim incident and the events leading up to Zack's death. This is the first time I've watched this since playing Crisis Core and I actually found it quite moving. I was also surprised by the brutality of it as his body is shot at close range by one of the guards. You know, it is moments like this though that the whole bringing a sword to a gunfight seems a bit silly. Granted Zack wasn't at his best here, but he's essentially taken down in a single shot. From my point of view recording this, I have already finished the game. However, what I realised in putting these last few videos together is that I forgot about the last two weapons. I guess it was a case of out of sight, out of mind, as one of them is under the ocean and the other is hiding under the sand near the gold saucer. But to the best of my knowledge, this is everything that we have to do in the world map, so when we return, it's into the northern cave we go.